This will increase certainty in the defense community as to funding and will allow military leaders to plan for our future defense needs. And most importantly, we will be defended because without defense, we don't have a country. As part of removing the defense sequester, I will ask Congress to fully offset the costs of increased military spending. In the process, we will make government leaner and more responsive to the public. I will ask that savings be accomplished through common sense reforms that eliminate government waste and budget gimmicks, and that protect, absolutely protect, hard-earned benefits for Americans. Government-wide, improper government payments are estimated to exceed $135 billion per year, and the amount of unpaid taxes is estimated to be as high as $385 billion a year. We can also reduce the size of the federal bureaucracy through responsible workforce attrition. That is... That is, when employees retire, they can be replaced by a smaller number of new employees. That's the best way to do it. We can also stop funding programs that are not authorized in law. Congress spent $320 billion last year on 256 expired laws. These are laws that are gone. Spent all of that money. Removing just 5 percent of that will reduce spending by almost $200 billion over a 10-year period. The military will not be exempt either. The military bureaucracy will have to be trimmed down. We have to create that strength, and sometimes we have to reduce bureaucracy. It just gets in our way. Early in my term, I will also be requesting that all NATO nations promptly pay their bills, which many are not now doing. Only five NATO countries, including the United States, are currently meeting their minimum requirement to spend 2 percent of GDP on defense. They understand it. They know they have to do it. They can afford to do it. They have no respect for our leadership. They have no respect for our country. They will do it. They'll be happy to do it. They will be happy to do it. <laughs> Additionally, I will be respectfully asking countries such as Germany, Japan, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, to pay more for the tremendous security we provide them. And they'll fully understand. They're economic behemoths. They're tremendously successful countries. But we're subsidizing them for billions and billions of dollars. I think they'll fully understand. Finally, we will have at our disposal additional revenues from unleashing American energy. The Institute for Energy Research cites a short-run figure of as much as $36 billion annually from increased energy production. Tremendous amounts of money. <laughs> tremendous numbers of jobs and tremendous amounts of money. And your electric bills will go down. There's something nice about that. Using these new funds, I will ask my Secretary of Defense to propose a new defense budget to meet the following long-term goals. We will build an active army of around 540,000. As the Army's Chief of Staff has said, he needs desperately and really must have to protect our country. We now We now have only 31 brigade combat teams, or 490,000 troops, and only one-third of combat teams are considered combat-ready.
That's not good for our country. I actually don't even like saying it because plenty of countries are watching us right now, but we'll get it shaped up very quickly. We will build a Marine Corps based on 36 battalions, which the Heritage Foundation notes is the minimum needed to deal with major contingencies. Right now, we only have 23. We will build a Navy of 350 surface ships and submarines, as recommended by the bipartisan National Defense Panel. We right now only have 276 ships, and it's not enough. And we will build an Air Force of at least 1,200 fighter aircraft, which the Heritage Foundation again has shown to be needed to execute current missions. We now have 1,113. Not enough. We will also seek to develop a state-of-the-art missile defense system. <laughs> Under Obama-Clinton, our ballistic missile defense capability has been degraded at the very moment in the United States history and its allies, we are facing the strongest and most heightened missile threat that we have ever, ever had. You look at Iran, you look at North Korea, you look at terrorists, we don't even know where to look. We don't know where to look. But believe me, you can look all over. So we are going to do that. We need a form of shield. We want to protect our country. As these potential adversaries grow their mission programs, U.S. military facilities in Asia and the Middle East, as well as our allies, are increasingly in range with the United States homeland, and we are really absolutely and potentially being threatened. And within two years, we will absolutely have a real threat. They'll be able to reach us so easily the way it's going right now. We propose to rebuild the key tools of missile defense, starting with Navy cruisers that are the foundation of our missile defense capabilities in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. The Obama-Clinton administration tried repeatedly to remove our cruisers from service, then refused to modernize these very old, aging, aging ships. They're old. They're tired. We will start by modernizing our cruisers to provide the ballistic missile defense capability our nation needs. This will cost around $220 million per modernization as we seek to modernize a significant portion of these 22 ships. It will also mean jobs for our country. Okay? Jobs for our country. And that is one of the big benefits. It's called jobs for our country, which we desperately need. As we expand our Navy toward the goal of 350 ships, we will also procure additional modern destroyers that are designed to handle the missile defense mission in the coming years. Accomplishing this missile rebuild and our military retooling will be a 50-state effort. Every state in the Union will be able to take part in rebuilding our military and developing technologies of tomorrow. In other words, the workers and the jobs will take place throughout the United States. In addition, we will improve the Department of Defense's cyber capabilities. A new threat, a new problem, very expensive, and we're not doing very well with cyber. Hillary Clinton has taught us, really, how vulnerable we are in cyber hacking. That's probably the only thing that we've learned from Hillary Clinton.
Which is why one of the first things we must do is to enforce all classification rules and to enforce all laws relating to the handling of classified information. Hillary Clinton put her emails on a secret server nobody knew about, except for the man that was given the fifth. Remember? <laughs> Whatever happened to him? Where is he? What happened to him? Where did he go? He pled the fifth. Never, that's the end of him. Ay, ay, ay. She put her emails on a secret server to cover up her pay-for-play scandals in the State Department. Nothing threatens the integrity of our democracy more than when government officials put their public office up for sale. We will also... We will also make it a priority to develop defensive and offensive cyber capabilities at our U.S. Cyber Command and recruit the best and brightest Americans. One of my first directives after taking office will be asking the Joint Chiefs of Staff and all relevant federal departments to conduct a thorough review of United States cyber defenses and identify all vulnerabilities. And we have to do that immediately, including to our power grid, our communication system, and all vital infrastructure. I will then ask for a plan to immediately protect those vulnerabilities and then fix them. At the same time, at the same time, we will invest heavily in offensive cyber capabilities to disrupt our enemies, including terrorists who rely heavily on Internet communications. <laughs> ISIS is using the Internet to recruit. ISIS is using the Internet to intercept and do all sorts of things to our country. We have to be many steps ahead of them and we will be. These new investments in cybersecurity and the modernization of our military will spur substantial new job creation in the private sector and help create the jobs and technologies of tomorrow. That's what we have to do. America must be the world's dominant technological powerhouse of the 21st century. And young Americans, including in our inner cities, should get these new jobs. Through training, through education, it will happen. We must also ensure that we have the best medical care, education, and support for our military service members and their families, both when they serve and when they return to civilian life. Our veterans are not being treated well. Our veterans, in many cases, are being treated worse than illegal immigrants, people that come into our country illegally. Our veterans are not being treated well. And by the way, Hillary Clinton has been doing this for 35 years. Now she says she can do it. She doesn't have a clue. Doesn't have a clue. Our debt to our men and women in uniform is eternal, always will be. To all of those who have served this nation, I say so strongly that I will never, ever let you down. We will protect those who protect us. It's very simple. We will protect those who protect us. 
And we will follow their example of unity. We will work across all racial and income lines to create one American nation. Together, we will have one great American future. Our potential is unlimited. We will be one people, under one God, saluting one American flag. And by the way, we love our flag. America will be a prosperous, generous, and inclusive society. We will discard the failed policies and division of the past and embrace true American change to rebuild our economy, rebuild our inner cities — they need help so desperately — and rebuild our country. We will bring back our jobs, and we will not let our jobs go to other countries. We will make America strong again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again, greater than ever before. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.